and start right now. Think help. Yes, thousand colonies. So the government introduced mention. This is the continuation of our study of church history with my friends here today. Let's go. The study of the saints. Since coming to the valley, the saints have spent their strength in settlement and survival. It was really tough. The time was that you do the large crop producing enough food for the winter, so I have got that. At the same time, we had the fort and building homes in the city. Church leaders organized them into Trinity Wards, each prayer over my bishop. New settlements also began to adapt to Slave Valley and the valleys to the north and south. Many cities started constructing shops, mills, and factories. The gathering place was the unique blessings of the saints were ready to welcome welcomed to the people of God. In March of 1849, an election was held to ratify officers for the proposed territory. And by early May, a 22-foot-long petition containing 2,270 signatures was on its way to Washington, D.C., proposing the creation of an immense territory, including all of what is now Utah and Nevada, portions of Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Wyoming, and Oregon, and a third of California, including a narrow strip on the Pacific coast taking in the port city of San Diego. This was a large territory. It was about the size of, well, it was the Great Basin, but it's going to be about the size of Texas, and they're proposing that it be made a territory. John M. Bernheisel was selected as an official delegate to Washington, D.C. to negotiate statehood for Deseret. Thomas Kane, an ever faithful friend, provided much help and advice. Kane suggested that they apply for statehood so they could govern themselves, inasmuch as territorial officials are appointed by the president. He suggested that Brigham Young be made governor. This was quite a suggestion that Brigham Young be made governor because. Brigham Young was not seen as a, as a politician, but Cain understood that, that people would do what Brigham Young says, so that's why he made the, the recommendation. A year earlier, at the request of Brigham Young, Cain had been in Washington and had spoken with President, President James K. Polk and other leading officials about a territorial government for Deseret. He had found little sympathy for the Mormons in Washington and therefore recommended that Deseret apply for statehood. He told Wilford Woodruff, you are better off without any government from the hands of Congress than a territorial government. That's what they believed, that you're better off with a territorial government, but it didn't work out that way. The political intrigues of government officers will be against you. You can govern yourselves better than they can govern you. You do not want corrupt political men from Washington strutting around you with military epaulets and dress who will speculate out of you all they can. Kane also recommended that Brigham Young be the governor because his head is not filled with law books and lawyers' tactics, but he has power to see through men and things. So there was very much a push for Utah to be a state and to bring him in the governor. Unfortunately, U.S. government officials were too preoccupied with pre-Civil War rhetoric and bickering over the slave issue to consider Deseret's application for statehood. Stephen A. Douglas of Illinois proved to be the church's best friend. So in the middle of this Civil War conflict, Stephen Douglas steps up for the Saints, and he does the following. As chairman of the Senate Territorial Committee, he suggested church leaders apply to be a territory instead of a state, because the South would not allow the addition of any free states. He also changed the name to Utah in honor of the Ute Indians and to avoid offending the congressman from Missouri. So Stephen A. Douglas becomes a friend 
but he opposes the exact opposite that the saints want. The saints want to be a state. And then you want to be called Deseret. He calls them Utah, and, and I encourage them to apply to be a territory. President Millard Fillmore signed the Compromise of 1850 into law, annexing California as a state and Utah and New Mexico as territories. Neither the Latter-day Saints nor the federal officials knew then that this action would begin 46 years of mistrust and conflict before statehood was finally granted. That's the understatement of the year award. But I just wanted to mention to you that making Utah Territory with territorial officials was a mistake in at least the 46 years of distrust. 46 years. Brigham Young was established as a territorial governor and other officials chosen among church members and those outside the church for political expediency. Conflict between the Gentile appointees and the members of the church began almost immediately. Brigham Young accused Mr. and Mrs. Broughton Harris of mishandling the government and the members of the church accused of being not much more than animals because of plural marriage practices. So, establishing a territory meant we have government officials come in and run the government, and that's what led to problems from the start. Because he believed there had been irregularities in the Brigham Young's handling of the census and election, federally appointed territorial secretary Broughton Harris refused to turn over the territorial seal and $24,000 appropriated for running the government. In addition, Judge Perry Brockus asked permission to speak in general conference, where he blasted the saints for their immorality and lack of patriotism. Which is pretty much that view is held by, by Americans across the nation, that we were immoral, and then we lacked patriotism. From the non-member point of view, members of the Church were guilty of sedition for speaking harshly against the United States and its officials. They were a peculiar and immoral people because of their unusual marriage practices, and they were under the un-American political domination of their Church leaders. So we had Church leaders? Versing our marriage, we're speaking harshly against the current government officials. They saw us as bad. We were just bad. The Latter day Saints, on the other hand, felt justified in criticizing the United States for not redressing their grievances against Missouri and not bringing the murderers of Joseph and Hiram Smith to justice. Furthermore, they pointed out that despite these injustices, they were loyal to the Constitution. Back in the eastern United States, news of Brigham Young's thundering rebuke of Judge Brockus caused an uproar. Newspapers accused the Church of being in open rebellion against the nation. Which, of course, we were not. One editor recommended sending the military to occupy Utah and maintain peace. The source of the news was Brockus himself. Although Brigham had tried to make peace with him after the conference, Brockus refused to apologize to the saints and penned a scathing account of Brigham's reaction to his speech. The ferment created by his remarks was truly fearful, Brockus wrote. It seemed as if the people, I mean a large portion of them, were ready to spring upon me like hyenas and destroy me. Now, of course, not having been in Utah themselves, but knowing Brockus, the people in the United States believe what Brockus wrote, and so the saints have a very, very, very ugly picture drawn of themselves. With the public decidedly against the saints, many people were calling on the president to remove Brigham from the governor's office. Brockus and the other officers, moreover, had written a detailed report of their tenure in Utah to the president. The report claimed that Brigham and the church dominated the region, controlled the minds and property of church members, and practiced polygamy. 
What are you gonna do if you're the president? What are you gonna do? After the report was published, Jedediah M. Grant took a copy to Thomas Kane, and they reviewed it together. Thomas read the claims about polygamy and dismissed them outright. They were nothing but absurd rumors, he believed. Jedediah grew uncomfortable. The rumors were not all false, he told Thomas. In fact, the, the, in fact, the saints had been practicing plural marriage for as long as Thomas had known them. But Thomas Kane, our only friend in Washington, D.C., did not know the reason for marriage. Thomas was stunned. For five years he had loved and defended the saints, often putting his reputation on the line for them. Why had they never told him that they practiced plural marriage? That's a great question. I don't know the answer, but they didn't tell him. He felt betrayed and humiliated. Thomas agonized for days over the knowledge, unsure if he could continue to help the saints. He assumed that polygamy disadvantaged women and threatened family unity. He worried that defending the saints might forever associate his name with the practice. He's in a tough spot. On December 29th, Cain wrote to John Bernheisel with a plan for, counter, for counteracting the officer's report. As I still recognize the relations of personal respect and friendship toward you, he stated, I will be ready to assist you if you desire me to. But he urged the saints to do two things, stop conceding plural marriage and explain the practice to the public. That is the most difficult thing to do. After irreconcilable differences became, become obvious, the four appointed officials left for Washington, D.C. with spurious and exaggerated reports about the saints. Brigham Young wrote a letter to Millard Fillmore expressing his views. After an investigation, the four officials were ordered to return or resign, and they all resigned. Four more congenial men were appointed, and power was returned and held by Brigham Young and locally elected, fish, elected officials. The most important legislative act passed on February 4, 1852, gave original jurisdiction in both civil and criminal cases to local probate courts which were presided over by church officials. This story is almost impossible to believe as Brigham Young maintains authority in Utah, which is good for us, but it was seen by the new nation as uh, someone who was, well, practicing plural marriage. This, in effect, made it possible in most instances for these local courts to displace the federal courts which were presided over by judges appointed by the President of the United States. The situation prevailed in Utah until Congress repealed the territorial stature, statute in 1874. So, we arrived in 1846. We were able to continue this thing for well, almost 30 years. Now, my friends, let me start right here. This is just the beginning of, of everything. It gets worse and worse and worse from here. But Brigham Young is still a prophet, and the saints are following the Lord. They wanted him to practice Palm Ridge. If I were to ask an audience, how many of you are descended from Palm Ridge? Almost everyone raised their hand. I descended from Palm Ridge. It was God's plan, but it was not the way things were going. As it was seen as a, as a terrible thing. Problems had arisen when three settlers in nearby Utah Valley killed a Ute named Old Bishop in an argument over a shirt. Isn't that terrible? When the Utes retaliated, Brigham had first urged the settlers not to fight back. His general policy was to teach the saints to live in peace with their Indian neighbors. But after counseling with the leader of the Provo settlement, who concealed the murder of Old Bishop from him, Brigham had ultimately ordered the militia to wage a campaign against the youth attackers. Ah, 
if the Saints would just keep the rules, they they they, they lie to Raymond so because he he tells them to fight against them. The swift and bloody campaign had put an end to fighting around Provo, but the tension it created spread quickly to San Pete Valley, where settlers had claimed choice land, blocking the Indians' access to fishing and hunting grounds. Out of hunger and desperation, some Indians began raiding cattle or demanding food from the settlers. When the federal officers arrived in the territory in the summer of 1851, plural marriages had become more common in the church, making it harder for the saints to shield the practice from visitors. In fact, at parties and other social gatherings, the officers met the wives of Brigham Young and Heber Kimball, who made no effort to conceal their relationship to their husbands. So, from the position of the United States of America, we're doing everything wrong that we possibly could do. From the position of God, we're doing everything right that we possibly could do. Well, the, the problem with the Indians wasn't God's will, but the plumber marriage is. A few months later, Brigham met with his closest advisors in Salt Lake City. Thanks to Thomas Kane, John Bernheisel, and Jedediah Grant, the, con the controversy with the territorial officials was over for now. Brigham remained the governor, and, a new federal, and new federal officers were sent to replace Brockus and others who had left Utah. Yet church leaders had still made no official statement about plural marriage, as Thomas had urged them to do. Thomas came away from feeling nauseated about plural marriage to feeling okay about it as long as they, we told the world we were doing it. Brigham contemplated the best way to announce the practice. With its headquarters in Utah securely established, the church had never been stronger. Also, plural marriage now had a central role in the lives of many saints greatly affecting how they understood their covenant relationship to God and their families. It was a matter of religion, it was a matter of spirituality, so they've got to tell the they're doing it. Keeping the practice private for much longer seemed both impossible and unnecessary. The time was right to make plural marriage public, and they decided to explain the practice more fully to the saints and the wider world at an upcoming two-day conference on missionary work. The next day, Orson Pratt stood to deliver the sermon on plural marriage to the saints. His words would be published in the Deseret News, and other newspapers across the world would quickly reprint its report. Orson designed this, he designed the sermon to teach missionaries the doctrinal foundations of plural marriage, so they could teach and defend the practice while serving in the mission field. Afterward, Brigham's clerk, Thomas Bullock, read the Lord's revelation on plural marriage to an overflowing congregation. Most of the saints, including those who practiced plural marriage, had never read the revelation before. Remember, we don't live in a time where people have phones or internet or anything else. People had never heard of this before. They never heard, they never heard the revelation. So even people are practicing plural marriage are here for the first time. Some rejoiced knowing that they could finally proclaim the principle freely to the world. During this time, missionary work across the globe was rapidly expanding with missionaries sent to all parts of the globe, the eastern United States, Great Britain, Italy, France, Scandinavia, South Africa, the islands of the Pacific Southwest, including Hawaii and other places as well. The missionaries were married men with children who were called from three to seven years. At the same time, the Book of Mormon, the Book of Mormon translation process also begins worldwide. Jonathan Appella, pictured here, helps George Q. Cannon translate the Book of Mormon into Hawaiian. The Book of Mormon translation had already occurred in Danish, French, German, Italian, and Welsh. So we see two or three things happening at the same time here. We're defending ourselves at the world against plural marriage. 
We're taking the gospel of the world with missionary efforts everywhere. We're translating the book of in many languages. We're trying to get the word out. All, all three have that in common. We're trying to get the word out to the world. We're a restored church. We're a restoration of New Testament Christianity. We're trying to live the gospel, and we're doing the best we can. On the morning of April 6, 1853, Brigham Young stood with his counselors, Hebert Kimball and Willard Richards, at the partially excavated foundation for the new temple in Salt Lake City. With the saints assembled, Brigham and his counselors laid the cornerstone in the southeast corner of the foundation. Each cornerstone weighed more than 5,000 pounds. Now, this temple will be torn down later, but we're not to that point yet. The temple would have six spires and would be much taller than the temples in Kirtland and Nauvoo, requiring a solid foundation to support its weight. In a meeting with architect Truman Angel, Brigham had sketched the temple on a slate and explained that its three eastern spires would represent the Melchizedek priesthood, while its three western spires would represent the Aaronic priesthood. Deacon, teacher, priest, concerning priesthood, high priest, seven the apostle, that's the, that's the, the priesthood. Your endowment is to receive all those ordinances in the house of the Lord, which are necessary for you after you have departed this life, to enable you to walk back to the presence of the Father, passing the angels who stand as sentinels, enable to give them the key words, the signs, and tokens pertaining to the holy priesthood, and gain your eternal exaltation in spite of earth and hell. That was the purpose of the temple. Five years ago, last July 1st, saw here the temple cornerstone not ten feet from where we lay the stone. He testified to the saints at the conference. I never looked at that ground what the vision of it was before me. As the saints dedicated themselves to project and pay their tithing, Brigham promised to would rise in beauty and grandeur, surpassing anything they ever seen or imagined. And some people still feel so that way, but it's less like the one today, they still feel like it's the most beautiful building they've ever seen. A year earlier, the Utah legislature debated the status of black slavery in Utah. It's a terrible, terrible thing. They bring men to the legislature who want slavery to become rights in that region. The several saints from the southern United States had already brought the slavery with them to the territory. What do you do with them? Brigham believes in the humanity of all people and the impulse of slavery as it existed in the American South, where enslaved men were what were considered property and lack basic rights. But like most people in the North and the United States, he believed back with the Black people were suited for the surgery. So Brigham believes believes in slavery and that he believes that black people are the best people to do the work. He also believes that they should not be considered property and lack basic rights. During the debates, Brigham declared publicly for the first time that people of black were going to say the God we are to the priesthood. This was quite a thing for a president of the church to do, but he he he, he did it. First time people have been ordained in North Church is it then a rapper for the other races on earth is just black people. And that lasts until 1970. As he explained the restriction, Brigham Young wrote a white paper saying that God had crushed black, the people of black America African descent. Let me read that one time. Brigham Young wrote a white paper saying that a mistaken idea that God had crushed people of black African descent. He also said that some of these black saints would have all the privileges and more enjoyed by the members of the church. Orson Spencer, a former mission president, who served in the legislature, the question of this restriction could have impact on work, and have a great impact on it. How did they also go to Africa? He then asked, We can't get them to the priesthood, are they going to have it? Have it? So this question about priesthood restriction went unresolved over in the legislature, all the way to the previous system of black servitude in the territory. I don't want to see what this, my friends. This is a sad time in the history of the church, but it happened, and it's true. Since we the Rocky Mountains, the same thing that is so much beyond the Valley, including the Arlington to the north and the north of the south. 
Ale ja chciałem zrobić robić w innym wygodnym sensie element. Próbuję also sobie pewnie z tym wygodnym, bo robię się co nie chcę, żeby się iron products, żeby nie chcę, żeby się nie chcę, żeby się nie Tragically, in the fall of 1983, Kevin John W. Gunson, who were already telegraphical members, were killed in the Indians. The rumors were that the, the, the Mormons did it. Twice in D.C., the Mormons did it. As a result, new legislative president Franklin Pierce refused to reappoint Mary Wing as his governor the next term, but the man he appointed in Senate petition to reappoint Mary Wing instead. When all the individuals Pierce appointed refused the position, he put the reappoint Mary Wing to the second term. The people who refused were smart. There's no way to follow them. The show was so successful in Europe in the early 1850s that there were 30,746 in Great British Isles. Well, that doesn't do any in Utah, so there's three times the saints in, in the British Isles that are in Utah. The provincial education fund helps some states obtain passage to Utah, but not very many. However, the friends of the Rose of the Rose for us to help, most community types are not going to be their own way. As the mission of success continues, the people are getting a task to arrange for the immigration of so many people, particularly since most commerce are poor. That is so true. The commerce in England, for example, were so poor they were just eating, eating they were just hand to mouth in terms of their food, etc. So, how could they raise enough money to come all the way to Utah? The PDF employed British agents to learn the right to the Great Basin to assist the United States. The agent in Liverpool, England, charged ships and sold and so charged for the immigrants. This port here that you see in the picture is exactly the way it appeared in 1850. This is the part, the same part that the same little walk down here on boats. In the first few years, the U.S. of the New Orleans were another representative made them in both packs of Missouri River and St. Louis. A third agent trans transit of the Missouri River of Panama to of any coast for a final agent for the Oil Journey in Utah. In 1855, the New Orleans Missouri River route was abandoned for other reasons. In favor of the uh, of entering the United States of Philadelphia, New York, or Boston, or the English or Israel, or here to see either see those searches and the rest. The entire journey is required eight to nine months. Can you imagine traveling from England to Utah? It take nine months to get there. When they walk in the island, they see a desert. You know, we have a century of seats over the states, which is only one seat, that's so only one rack. The same service is attributed this moral safety record to the hand of Providence, and the fact that the were often dedicated most of the embarking on an immigrant voyage. This is where they went. They went from everywhere in Europe, around the world, to come to the United States. Notice we got people coming all the way through Asia, to the Southern Asia, to the other, to Australia. To eat in Hawaii, coming out of America, around Africa. This is the greatest story ever told. It's it's the story of the saints coming to Utah. Is really one of the greatest stories ever told. We'll face you next time. I just want to remind you that you that that God is real, and there's some tough things we talk about today in the history of the church. We talk about some tough things. We talk about slavery and how hard that was on the saints, early in the saints. We talked about upon marriage and how hard that was for the saints in the early times. We talked about how the, the Latter-day Saints were misunderstood and, and how they were misrepresented by, to the public because of their parents upon marriage because they were unwillingness to to dis, to dis continue or disrupt slavery. It's a tough time to go to the church. For the first part, you got to, if you're most members of the church are in Europe, so you got to travel nine, nine months to get to Utah. Second part, when you get to Utah, you see it's Utah. Utah hasn't changed that much, it's still Utah. And it was a desert. Uh, so that's tough. And the third thing is the leaders of the church are trying so hard to keep the Latter Saints in Utah and keep them together. And next week we're going to study how they got there to the hand cars, which is so difficult. And then they had, and then the winter is bad, and they starved for two years because they can't get any crops to grow. 
These are our, our ancestors, my friends. These are the people who created the church in, here in the West. They couldn't have suffered more. They suffered physically. They suffered spiritually. They suffered politically. They suffered socially for what they believed in and what they did was right. I think most of us probably come from plenary families. I know I do. And so we will that they practice that practice so that there are some people that could live, tell a story. At the same time, I'm very sorry to, to report to you that so many things that the Saints did back then were against American culture or uh, play politics, and we were harassed for 50 years for it. I said it's going to be very difficult to tell you, but the fact of the matter is the Saints endured. They endured suffering. They endured, it wasn't just physical suffering, they endured political harassment. They endured so many things so that we could have this what we have today. I look around at our world today and I think, how many people know what the Saints have suffered to get here? Most people don't know, most of the Saints don't know. We feel like we're suffering if we don't have enough food to eat. We feel like we're suffering if we, if we have, a, if our car breaks or something. These people are really, really sober, but they had testimony that, that God lives and the church is true, and they were right. I have a testimony that the church is true. It was, it was, they were doing God's will, the practice for marriage. They needed to do it to increase the number of saints, the number of people here in Utah and, and certain areas. And so we were that they practice it, even though it was very difficult and they did it for 50 years. And so we were that they give up all the, all the hardships to travel nine, mo mo nine months to get to Utah, only to find it was a desert here. And then we sent to Panaka, Nevada, or somewhere in New Mexico, or somewhere else. And so we were, they were willing to do that for us, so that we could have a nice place to live, and a nice church to live in. It's not one prayer that we'll stay faithful to the church, that we'll, we'll remember their sacrifices. Their sacrifices weren't wrong, their sacrifices weren't, they weren't, they weren't, they weren't, they weren't wrong, they were just difficult. But I mean, they were right, they did, they did the right things for the right reasons, and that's the history of the church, I've heard this church, I've seen the Jesus Christ, amen.